No one really understands the internet. Well, that may that may not be true, but a lot of people don't understand the internet and hyperstition. A perfect example of this is this. The OK symbol, right? There are many people, uh, a lot of them journalists and uh, left-wing pundits, for example, who claim that the OK hand sign is a white supremacist symbol. And there are many on the right who say, what the fuck are you talking about? It's just an OK hand sign. If this was a debate that was happening in the age of simple, tangible reality, or at least the belief in one, the common belief in one, this debate would never exist because there would be a correct answer. However, in our current state of unreality, or whatever you want to call it, hyper, multi, pseudo, zeno, whatever prefix you like, postmodern, perhaps, both of these people are correct. It, it is both a symbol of white supremacy and uh, right-wing extremism, and also... At the same time, it is just the OK hand sign. Because on the internet, the laws of reality don't work the same way. And to explain this, I have to explain a little bit of quantum theory. This is very basic quantum physics. I'm not a quantum physicist, so I only know very basic quantum physics. But there's this thing called Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. Uh... And actually, you may have heard of Schrodinger's, Schrodinger's cat. This is very, very easy to understand. Essentially, the laws of reality that govern our existence, uh, for example, Newtonian physics, very basic stuff that we take for granted, like I can point at this light and say that light is there, and it is there. Once you start looking at really small things, these things break down. In the quantum realm, which just means really small things, you can't point at something and say it is there because things don't really exist at that level in the same way as they do to us on this, le on this macroscopic reality. In the quantum realm, things exist as clouds of probability. They are pro probability clouds. Uh, essentially, I can say this electron is most likely to be here. But there's also, that's just the center of the probability cloud. There is a probable, there is a calculable probability that it is also here and here and here or wherever. There is no it is here, but that doesn't mean it's, that it, this, is un, this is fake. It's, there is a calculable probability that it is also here and here and here and here and everywhere. In fact, there's a theory that there is only one electron and every electron that we see is actually just the same electron uh, popping up in different places in its probability cloud across the entire universe. And uh, I don't, as to my knowledge, that theory has not been 100% disproven. Um, and this isn't made up fake philosophy this is hard science that's provable in fact on a macro scale a lot of things wouldn't work if this weren't true uh, a really easy example is sense of smell when you inhale something when you inhale through your nose uh, you get little particles and they go into your nose and in your nose you have little things that are in certain shapes and those shapes can attach to certain particles and if the particle fits perfectly into that shape like a jigsaw puzzle then that is what tells you what it smells like uh, the sense of smell wouldn't work uh, in the same way without something called quantum tunneling 
which is based on this uncertainty principle that everything is a probability cloud. So quantum tunneling, say I have a big wall here and there's an electron on one side of the wall over here. There is a chance in its probability cloud that it is over here as well. And sometimes you will look at it and it will just be over here, despite the fact that there's a solid wall in the way. That is called quantum tunneling. And our nose does this because a lot of these things that the tiny particles fit into it are so small that quantum physics affects it. And they have solid walls on all sides. So the only way a particle could possibly get in there is via quantum tunneling. And it does. It's proven. Look it up, bitch. I'm not citing my sources, but they are, they do exist. I can't be bothered to find them, but you can look it up and it's real. I'm not lying to you right now. You see, it's kind of the same on the internet. That things can sort of exist and... Just because something doesn't exist in the same way as it does in the reality that we're used to observing doesn't mean it's not real. Things can just work in different ways, but that doesn't mean they're fake. And this is essentially what hyperstition kind of is. It's a, the sort of idea that if you, if you, if something is, it's, it's, it's obvious, look, to, let's, let's deconstruct the language here. Superstition and hyper more than beyond superstition. Uh, when is an idea not an idea? When is it more than an idea? Be well, that is when it's super, when it's hyperstition. A great example of this would be Pepe, right? Uh, Pepe started as a little meme, just a regular meme on the 4chans, became pretty normified, very big on Reddit, and uh, 4chan tried various things to try and reclaim this meme, because we all know what happens once the mainstream gets hold of a meme. The meme becomes oversaturated and unfunny. I mean, I would argue that it was already like that before Reddit got its hands. But anyway, there is a reason that people don't want Reddit and popular culture to really have their hands on particular memes if uh, they're linked to, if you find it funny, you don't want it to die. So first 4chan tried uh, to make a bunch of gore and scat and, all, and Pepe's drawings with disgusting things, but that didn't work because no one would spread them to Reddit, uh, or it didn't actually... The, there was not enough, so it was just like that sort of a weird thing that exists over there, but doesn't really relate. But then, they just started associating Pepe with the already very present right-wing forces on 4chan, because they were posting it. And uh, because they said that Pepe is a right-wing thing, certain people started saying, well, we can't use Pepe now because it's a right-wing thing. Uh, people who didn't want to be associated with that sort of stuff. But then, the right-wingers, who may have been using Pepe beforehand, took note of the people who didn't want to be associated and said, that's a right-wing thing, we can't be associated with it. And those right-wingers then took a hold of Pepe. The, it's, as To quote Richard Spencer before he got punched in the face, uh, this is Pepe, it's sort of become a symbol for the alt-right. Uh, remember, Richard Spencer, the man who coined the term alt-right. If anyone is alt-right, it is him. So, Pepe went from being a completely innocuous drawing of a frog to being an actual symbol of white supremacy used by white supremacists and white supremacists saying it was that. Uh, this is how things work on the internet because reality isn't really what most people think it is but to talk about this I have to talk about I'm an immigrant but not to the country of England or anything like that now I'm, I'm actually an immigrant to the internet see a lot of people say they were born and moulded and grow up on the internet and th that's their real home now I still think the, the internet is my real home but I didn't get there until later than most people I am an immigrant you see when I was a child my parents didn't really let me 
have any sort of internet access or video game access. I've told this story a little bit before, uh, mostly about the video game stuff, but uh, when all my friends in uh, primary school were on MSN and stuff like that, talking to themselves, a lot of them had Facebook accounts at a young age, um, talking about YouTubers, all that sort of stuff. I never had a computer. The only time I could use the computer was when my parents very rarely left me alone in the house when they went out, which, yeah, it was not very common. Now, oftentimes when they did this, if I was a, uh, my mum who would do this, well, at hers, I had Cartoon Network on the TV. So it didn't matter if she went out because I would just be watching Cartoon Network on TV anyway. I wouldn't bother generally to go on the computer. Uh, and at my dad's, however, sometimes uh, I would sneak onto his computer when he went out. Uh, and I'd have to immediate. I very quickly learned how to delete my browsing history and use privacy techniques, uh, which I guess may influence why I'm so privacy minded with my internet browsing to this day. Eventually, my dad's laptop uh, sort of broke and he gave it to me and he got a new computer. Uh, when I say it sort of broke, the Wi Fi card, I don't really know what was broken on it, I was quite young at the time, I didn't, don't know why, like what happened to it, uh, it's long gone now, but for some reason the Wi-Fi stopped working, and he had this cheap little Wi-Fi dongle, the cheapest Wi-Fi dongle, like a tiny little thing, USB thing, you put it in, it can connect to the internet, but really slowly, so that was my first experience with the internet, uh, very similar to how most people who grew up in the 90s experience of the internet was this really slow dial-up connection. Well, for me, I was on this really slow dongle that just half the time didn't even work. Uh, but the difference is everyone else had normal internet and we were well into the age of broadband internet at this point. So there I was with my dongle, uh, watching YouTube videos in 240p. So what did I do with my newfound freedom to explore the internet? Well, the first thing I did was go to YouTube.com. I think I'd heard people in primary school talking about YouTube, and that is how I discovered it. Um, I was big into Fred at the time. Actually, I wasn't that big into Fred. I think I was just a little... I think I, I watched a couple Fred videos, and then just sort of um, wasn't super into it. But I was definitely really into um, Ed's World, which you may know. It's an animated like flash, a series of flash animations about a bunch of... In, uh, British kids who go around often killing zombies and stuff like that. Um, a lot of stuff has happened since then with Ed's World, but at the, at the first, you should go back and watch some of those Ed's World, old school Ed's World cartoons, they're pretty funny. Um, I used to watch that with my friend Simon, who I'm still friends with, and uh, I was also really, for some reason, I guess it's not for some reason, I can see why this is appealing to a child, uh, really into extreme sports videos. I would look at lots of videos of FMX, which is like motorbike jumps and flips and uh, BMX jumping, mountain bike tricks, uh, all sorts of stuff like that. Travis Pastrana, X Games, uh, Nitro Circus, all that sort of thing. I used to spend a really long time going down related videos, searches of that. Uh, I also stumbled across a few YouTube poops at, at that time. Um, curious how YouTube poop humour evolved to be the humour of the mainstream internet, but started so much earlier. When most of the internet was still laughing at rage comics, YouTube poops were so far ahead. That's quite interesting. Anyway, uh, that was my so that was my introduction to the internet. M much later, this was late late primary school coming into secondary school. Uh, this is pro around, the so then, right at the end of this time period, I discovered 4chan. Um, I don't really remember how I discovered 4chan. Um, I think I maybe just, like, heard or tell of it on YouTube or something. I'm, I, I don't have many memories of this, like, what the sort of things I was doing on the internet were. That's just, like, I, I was definitely, I definitely remember going on some sort of forum, but I don't remember what forum it was or anything like that. 
and I remember going on 4chan being really, like, not knowing what, because if you just go on, like, 4chan.org or whatever, you just get that square with all the board names on it, but I didn't really know what to click. Uh, it was strange. It was very strange. Um, uh, I don't even remember which boards I used to go on at that time. Uh, I only very briefly was into 4chan. I don't think I ever made a post at that time uh, before I went decided to become a normie and started using Imager instead. At that time I had a, but by that point I'd gotten my, like, my first smartphone and uh, that sort of thing happened. Um, but before that, before I had the internet, what was I doing with my time? I mean, I remember at this point, I mean, I was still dictated by my parents and they wouldn't let me go on the internet for very long. If they saw me on the computer for too long, they'd tell me to get off and they weren't using the internet for anything because this was back in the 2000s it wasn't like you had to be online all the time so if I didn't get off they would just turn the router off uh, they, I, they didn't care so uh, m what did I spend most of my time doing in this time before I had access to the internet and before I and all that sort of thing well I mostly read a lot of books uh, and also played with a lot of bionicles which was sick Bionicles are sick. I refuse to acknowledge anyone who does not respect Bionicles. Bionicles are fucking amazing. Um, I spent a lot of time on the internet. I mean, uh, reading books, mostly like young adult fiction. But bear in mind, I was around uh, like maybe not, I was much younger than these books are targeted at. I mean, these books are targeted at teenagers. I'm talking like a Hunger Games type stuff the sort of thing that's targeted at teenagers, but I was reading this stuff when I was, like, much younger, and I was also reading a lot of pop science things, uh, which I think is one of the big reasons why it took me so long to get expelled from my school, because they, they didn't want to kick me out because they thought I was a child prodigy in physics. Uh, I, when I was uh, in year six, or year five, I don't remember which, uh, I gave a lecture to one of the lower years, like a full-on hour-long lecture that I planned out with flashcards and everything, like little notes, planned out an entire lecture uh, about astrophysics and I, I briefly explained uh, Einstein, general relativity and special relativity with demos and stuff, uh, which I'm still, you know, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not gonna lie, I feel pretty good about the fact that I at least had a very basic understanding of that stuff when I was still young. Obviously, it never turned out well because turns out I'm dyscalculic and maths is incredibly important for physics. Uh, especially just the, like, when you actually get to the really advanced physics stuff, the sort of maths you do in school is not really relevant at all. It's all algebraic equations, which I've never been too bad at. But the sort of maths that you do in school, the arithmetic and geometry and that sort of thing, especially arithmetic, I'm really bad at. Uh, like to the point where it's a disorder called dyscalculia, um, which I didn't know for most of my life, so there's something. Uh, but yeah, turns out you can't qualify for doing physics in university if you fail maths or don't get a really good grade on maths. So uh, that's basically when I, but that, that I only realized this much, uh, much, much later after, a long time later. Uh, before this, I was mostly, I'd, I'd read a lot of physics books, uh, Mostly, target, mostly ones targeted at adults um, and a lot of young adult fiction uh, mostly because I just didn't really know that adult fiction existed uh, the only thing I knew about was Catcher in the Rye because my dad gave it to me he said every teenager in the world loves Catcher in the Rye and I didn't like it and I still don't really like it um, I guess that's just personal amount of personal taste uh, I also read To Kill a Mockingbird and I read of Mice and Men because without, I read of Bison Man much later. Um, anyway, what I'm trying to say is that uh, in this case, I'm Batman and you're Bane. I merely adopted the darkness. You were born into it, molded by it. Whatever that quote is. Uh, but for some reason, it appeals to me way more than most people. Maybe it's because I had the experience of not living with it. Uh, I don't know, but I had to adapt to it. I never owned a console until, like, <laughs> two weeks ago-ish, when I bought my PS2. And I still haven't really played it. 
I don't know. I'm, what I'm trying to say is that for some reason, something in my brain has just been telling. Maybe I just have some sort of outside perception, just very slightly, from most of the people who uh, identify with the internet as much as I do, because they tend to be people who really, really were on the internet all the time from a really young age, whereas I it took me a long time to really get deep, in, deep into the internet. Like, even because just as I would have gotten really deep into the internet, deep into 4 gen culture and, all, and IRCs and that sort of thing, was when I decided to become a normie and switch to Imgur and Reddit, and I, I only, I didn't use those very often, and mo mostly just went back to YouTube and Facebook and surface net stuff like that, uh, because I was trying my best to not be a weirdo, which to my, had to end up in my detriment, but I wasn't supposed to, how was I supposed to know that? Uh, so that, maybe this outside perspective has given me some sort of different way of viewing things from most people, but I'm pretty sure that the internet is a different dimension. Things don't work the same on the internet as they do in meat space. This seems like a really obvious conclusion to me, like something that everyone should be completely aware of. However, most people seem to just completely distract themselves from it. The idea that the internet is in some way following different laws than the rest of reality, and therefore is demonstrably separate from the rest of reality, or at least a different layer to the rest of reality, is, is something that's just generally not talked about. Uh, but we all kind of know that it's true. I mean, just... I've already given a bunch of examples of how magic is real on the internet. You can just think something into being true. Truth doesn't really matter. If this isn't the ultimate disproving of the Enlightenment era thought that humanity tends towards truth and goodness, then I don't know what is. Just look at how popular anti-vaxxer pages are on Facebook, and how Facebook literally has had to now step in to moderate the fact that people are killing their children because they're too stupid to understand that vaccines are good. This is the ultimate proof that Enlightenment thinkers were just actively incorrect in their assumption that humanity has any sort of tendency towards truth. Truth has never mattered, and on the internet, truth and reality become the same thing. Because when we're here in this layer of reality, I feel like I should explain a little more what I mean by layer of reality. This is not really like, uh, it's, it's not like an onion where the layers are completely disconnected from each other, you've got the inner layer and then one out of it, like a shell, like tree rings. It's not really like that. It's kind of... I've been struggling since I started thinking about this idea to come up with a metaphor, so I just have to explain. I don't think I'm going to be able to find a metaphor. Maybe... maybe Jenga. Maybe Jenga is a good metaphor. It's... It, it's, it's not quite what I'm thinking of. There must be a good metaphor for this somewhere, but what I mean is the layers aren't necessarily completely separate from one another. Like, they kind of, at some points they melt into each other, at some points they're basically indistinguishable from each other, uh, to the point where it might seem like there are no layers, but at other points they're extremely obviously separate. Um, some easy examples of separate layers of reality would be the quantum realm, uh, the realm of consciousness, the internet, um, all these things are very apparently separate from what we consider and perceive as tangible reality, but they also seamlessly blend in with tangible reality. Without the quantum realm, the tangible reality we live in would operate, wouldn't even operate at all. Not that they would operate completely different, it just wouldn't work. Uh, without conscious thought, there would be no one to observe reality. However, the act of thinking, the act of being conscious, actively warps reality because you, it's impossible to perceive something the same way as it exists. I mean, even just, we generally think of reality as being a visual thing or a tangible thing, something you can touch is something that's real or something that you can see and 
it is something that's real, but this is provably incorrect because oxygen exists, so then it's just something that you can demonstrate exists exists, but things exist that we can't demonstrate exist. We are quite happy to admit that things exist that are really hard to demonstrate they exist. Uh, for example, dark matter and dark energy especially. Dark energy is the big culprit here because dark energy is, to me, very obviously a flaw in the basic way we understand the universe. The idea that most of the stuff in the universe is this dark energy that we can't see or perceive in any way, uh, but definitely exists and is the reason that the universe is expanding faster. Uh, it seems like something that's very unlikely. It may be true, but if it is true, then it points to us as being completely incapable of understanding the universe, because if most of the things that exist are something that we cannot physically perceive, no matter how hard we try, no matter what sort of instruments we use, we just know that theoretically it has to exist or things won't work, then it's very hard to see that fact and not realise how completely limited we are by our own perceptions. So, the internet being a different layer of reality. Firstly, we have to set up the idea that we didn't invent the internet. Or we sort of did, but we sort of just adapted something that was already there. Um, the really obvious example of this is mycelial networks. Um, Essentially, mushrooms uh, have these vast, vast underground networks of interconnected tendrils and mycelia, uh, which can very rapidly transmit thoughts and ideas of mushroomy ideas, I guess, across vast plains of forest or jungle floor or underground. Uh, they're so complex and networked that they are, they even look kind of similar to neurons if you were to take them out of the dirt without damaging them. The crisscrossing pattern would quite similarly resemble a human brain. Maybe not that much. May, I'm not going to go as, so far as to say that mushrooms have intelligence comparable to humans or consciousness that is comparable to humans. I'm sure that the way mushroom intelligence and consciousness works is entirely incomprehensible to a human brain, or at least so different as to be maybe not even called consciousness. But at the same time, I think it would be disingenuous to act like this isn't a thing that exists. There are mycelial networks. There have been for millions and millions of years before humans arrived on this planet. Uh, Mushrooms and fungi were the first living organisms to be on land. They've been around for much, much, much longer than us, and even much longer than plants, and they most likely will be around for much longer than plants after they die, because mushrooms are really good at being alive. They just, they're just really good at it. So, humans didn't really invent the internet, um, nor did the in does the internet really encompass what I'm talking about, which is why from now on I'm going to be using the term wired. If you want to see what my definition of wired comes from, once again, for the millionth time I recommend you to read uh, Hello from the Wired and Introduction to Cyber Nihilism by Nix. It's a paper about this philosophy, this, this philosophy called Cyber Nihilism. Uh, it's good. Highly recommend it. Uh, but she, she sets up this uh, definition of the wired as more than the internet, that the internet is the gentrified wired, which I think is a, anytime two devices are connected, that is, they have connected via the wired, the wired is the connection, anytime any two separate entities are connected, they are connected via the wired, in some sense even the act of speaking I think could be, uh, maybe it's a bit of a stretch, but it wouldn't be impossible to imagine that as being some sort of tentacle of the wired, if you understand what I'm saying. So, the, the wired exists, has existed, and will exist, and at this point is quite separate from humanity. Uh, no matter how hard world governments try to control the wired, they really can't do it, because the wired is not a human thing anymore. It's long past that. In fact, as I said before, it kind of was never a human thing, it, it just kind of is there. It's kind of a nat like a thing that just happens, an emergent property of life forms. I'm not really sure. I definitely wouldn't go as far as to say I understand it, but it's something. Um, it's something that is undeniable. I need to, to probably do some more research and thought into this sort of thing, but 
the, the idea that the wired is something uniquely and controllably human is, is just provably incorrect. Just look at, like, China, for example. They really, really try. And we have, of every country on Earth, I think China is the country that has the most stake in controlling the internet. And it is really not uncommon for Chinese citizens to access the outside China internet. And that is just the internet. I mean, look at the... the mesh networks popping up in Venezuela and that sort of thing, it's impossible to control the wired. The wired is not a human thing. The wired exists on its own as a separate layer of reality. But it's a layer of reality which, as I said before, is in uh, interconnected. They're all interconnected. There, There is no complete separation. In events that happen on the wired do have consequences in meat space, and events that happen on meat space do have consequences in the wired. They're not completely separate. However, the rules of the wired do not match the rules of meat space. Laws such as this is true, this is not true, objectively, really have very little stake in the wired, uh, which is why the OK hand sign can be both a white supremacist symbol and an innocent gesture at the same time, and both parties be completely correct. Because it's in the wired, there's no limitation uh, of truth and untruth, there's no one and zero. Uh, just like in the quantum realm, there is no certainty about where something is, things can just sort of be in probability clouds. Uh, the, the entire concept of truth and justice and all that sort of thing crumbles apart once the wired is introduced. So, there we have it. Journalists and people <laughs> and motherfuckers like you and me. The Wired is, is sort of an eldritch <laughs> elder god that we can't really hope to comprehend. So I think trying to pretend that we do is just, just a, a stupid, stupid thing. Real stupid and arrogant human thing to do. You know, I, I think I confuse people with what is my political ideology. What, what 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 do you think about politics and, and philosophy? You know, I, hey, 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 no thank you. I've heard you mention Max Stirner and cyber nihilism and uh, all that sort of thing, but what, what do you actually think? What do you actually think? Well, my philosophy is, is actually incredibly simple. Um, it's, it's, incred it's so incredibly simple that it can be summed up in uh, in one sentence, what what do you want? What what for asking someone what is your personal philosophy is essentially asking them what do you want, and the answer is incredibly simple: the total extinction of the human race. Now hold on just a minute, there, buddy. We're reaching levels of edginess that should not be allowed to exist. I mean, come on, you can't really want the extinction of the entire human race, and if you do, you're an idiot. I mean, you're a human being. If you want that, just start with yourself. Just kill yourself right now, because that's a stupid thing. I'm a human. I don't want you to kill me. Hey, I never said I want to kill anyone. You know, that's really short-sighted of you to just assume that I want to murder everyone. I don't say I want to murder anyone, I just don't want people to have children. It's pretty, it's pretty simple, just don't have kids, just keep your dick in your pants, it's really, really easy, just use a condom, they exist, they're cheap, just buy a bloody condom, <laughs> it's not hard, just don't have children, just don't do it, why would you do it? Life is entirely made of suffering. To put a child into this world is probably the most abhorrent act that you could possibly commit. I don't understand how you could possibly forgive yourself for that, to be honest. Being a human is terrible. The moment that people realized that we were people and were cursed with consciousness, everything just went terribly wrong. What the fuck were we thinking? Well, not much back then, but now, way too much. It's a common idiom that, uh, stupid people have more fun, or, um, what's the word? Um, ignorance is bliss, that's the idiom I'm thinking of, ignorance is bliss. Uh, well, you know what else is bliss? Vaping. Ah, <sighs> uh, yes. It tastes like, 
it tastes like the total death of the human race. By the way, I'm just parroting Thomas Ligotti right now, so I feel that, you know what, maybe I should just directly quote some Thomas Ligotti. Um, uh, let me let me just directly quote some something from the conspiracy against the human race. I think I have it right here. Ah oh, yes, I do. How helpful! It's almost like I had this video set up, uh, but then forgot to scroll to the correct page before I started recording. Uh, it's almost like I put some thought into something. I'm just going to read the first, uh, the opening sentences of. Conspiracy Against the Human Race by Thomas Ligotti. In fact, I'll just show you on camera so you can read along with me. For ages they had been without heads. Headless they lived and headless they died. How long they had thus flourished, none of them knew. Then something began to change. It happened over unremembered generations. The signs of a transfiguring were being writ even more deeply into them. As their breed moved forwards, they began crossing boundaries whose very existence they never suspected and they trembled. Some of them eyed their surroundings as they would a strange land into which they had wandered, even though their dark, even though their kind had trod the same earth for countless seasons. And during idle moments after dark, they looked up at a sky filled with stars and they felt themselves small and fragile in the vastness. More and more, they came to know a new way of being. It was as if objects around them were one thing and they were another. The world was moving farther and farther away, and they were at the centre of, of this movement. Another world was forming inside their heads. They now had. Each of them in time became frightened in a way that they had never known. In the former days, they were frightened only by sights and sounds in the moments they saw or heard them. Now they were frightened by things they could not, things that were not present to their senses. They were also frightened by visions that came not from outside them but from within them. Everything had changed for their kind. They could never return to what had once been, for the what they once had been. The epoch had passed when they and the rest of creation were one and the same. They were beginning to know a world that did not know them. This is what they thought, and they thought it was not right. Something which should not be had become, and something had to be done if they were to flourish as they had before, if the very ground beneath their feet were not to fall f away from under them. They could do nothing about the world which moved farther and farther away from them, and which knew them not. So they would have to do something about their heads. If that's not entirely obvious, Mr. Ligotti there is talking about the development of consciousness in human beings, and uh, how it was, it was pretty much an awful idea for all involved. Uh, it's just pretty, uh, pretty much a mistake, universally accredited as a terrible mistake. Um, once you become conscious, you become uh, alienated from the world. You see, a lot of Marxists use the term alienation to mean separation between the worker and the products of the labour and capitalist alienation, and no, it's so awful, it's so terrible. But they don't really dive deep enough into that subject that alienation is actually just a side effect of consciousness. And consciousness overall, pretty big mistake. If you ask someone, is life a good thing? Is life good? Is being alive good? Uh, most people will probably say, yeah, you know what? It's, it's probably good. It's pretty good. And obviously, there are some pessimists who would say, nah, it's not good. And uh, they're probably the rare breed. Most likely, most people would think, yeah, life is probably a good thing to be alive. Uh, so wh why would anyone possibly think either of those things. Why would someone think being alive is a bad thing? Uh, well, generally, a lot of the argument is, once again, I'm just parroting Ligotti here, if you want to know what I think, just read Conspiracy Against the Human Race. Uh, it's a good book. Read books instead of watching YouTube videos. They're better. You can find it for free on Wizard Chan of all places. Yep, that's where that PDF I was showing you is hosted, on Wizard Chan. Who knows? Those, maybe they really are wizards over here. <laughs> Something just happens to them. You know what? It's actually not that surprising. Anyway. To get, without explaining myself too deeply and just, because I'm not going to do as good a job as Ligotti does. He's a much smarter person than me, and I haven't done as much reading as he did. The amount of other philosophers he cites in that book, which, if you haven't guessed, I'm currently rereading, 
uh, is just absurd. He's constantly citing other sources from around the world, including, you know, everything from Zen Buddhists to ancient philosophers like Zeno and Italian philosophers from all, all sorts of people from all around the world. A lot of the work that he cites hasn't even been translated into English at the time that he was writing. So who knows how, who knows what's going on. Uh, but uh, even I can tell that he is right. And that basically this is what I've been thinking for a really long time and just not really had the balls to confront. That consciousness was a mistake. Uh, and this has been kind of the basis for my philosophies throughout the years without really understanding it. Because you see, at first I thought, well, life kind of sucks. I wonder why. I wonder why life kind of sucks. Oh, I know why. I know why it's capitalism. Obviously, capitalism shit. Am I saying cap- am I- hold on. Hold on a minute. Is there no thank you going back on his idea, on his anti-capitalist, dirty, commie ideas? Hell no. I still think capitalism is shit. Uh, so I started to reading into some anarcho-syndicalist stuff and was like, yeah, capitalism, not so great. A lot of other people have had the same idea. Money, bad idea. States, bad idea. Classes, bad idea. Working, bad idea. And I was like, working, bad idea. Hold on a minute, what's going on here? Working is a bad idea, but these people seem to like the idea of work. What's going on there? Did a little more reading. Ah, see, the problem isn't that capitalism is unsustainable. The problem is that civilization any human civilization is inherently unsustainable because humans just don't work. Uh, why, hold on a minute, why is civilization so unsustainable? Let me go and read some stuff. Read a bunch of stuff. Pretty good stuff. Pretty good stuff. A little bit of Bob Black, a little bit, little bit of Sterner, a little bit of Blessed as the Flames, some insurrectionary anarchist stuff like that. The Coming Insurrection, Invisible Committee, Tikkun, Tikkun? don't know how to pronounce it. Debord, all these lads, all these total lads, they sort of understood this sort of thing. Uh, start reading some accelerationist stuff, you know. Maybe, maybe Nick Land, maybe the CCRU have the answer. Maybe, maybe it's all these lads, who knows. Maybe, maybe they're right. Maybe, maybe uh, since capitalism is unstable, we should use that to our advantage to accelerate some sort of collapse. But hold on a minute, some people don't understand what accelerationism means. Uh, like some little lad who decided to go shoot up a mosque. Turns out uh, accelerationism is anti-praxis. Very basic bit of accelerationist philosophy, at least coming it from the CCRU angle, is that there is no praxis for accelerationism. It's not really a, uh, you should do this. It's not like, it's not like, okay, well, you want to be a Marxist? Well, go form a union and go do, go join Antifa or whatever. It's not, it's an, accelerationism isn't like that. It's more of just a interpretation. It's, it's just like a, it's more of a philosophical interpretation, and like a. There's definitely a politics to it, a politics of alienation. I'm not really sure how to explain it in words. I'm getting off topic. So I started thinking that civilization might be the problem, and that maybe the solution was to go beyond civilization in some sort of post-civilization, transhumanist world. But then. I started thinking about, like, why be transhumanist? Like, what's the point of being more human than human? Because being human is kind of the root cause of all these problems. And then I read uh, Hello from the Wired, an introduction, just as I was talking about before. A lot of burps going on here, a lot of hiccups, a lot of weird little things going on in my gut. Um, Oh yeah, that's the other thing. You think you're in control? I'm sorry, you're not in control. The gut bacteria is in control. The gut bacteria owns your brain. I'm sorry. Did, were you actually wandering around? Were you just walking around here thinking that your brain was in control of your body and your thoughts and your actions? <laughs> oh my god. You, I, can't believe, I can't believe you actually thought that. What, what an idiot. It's your gut bacteria. They are in control. Look it up, bitch. The gut bacteria own you. They really do. I'm not exaggerating here. A lot of people think I'm just memeing. Oh, he's just, that's just, that's just, no thank you. He's just a little bit of a memester. You know, he's just, he's just memeing about that, that whole gut bacteria thing. He's just a little jokester about the whole post-human moss world thing going on. He just watched Lane too many times. 
Um, 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 ooh, maybe you're looking to gut bacteria and then come back to me when you still think you own your brain. Oh, 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 wait, what, what, what do you mean the world is bad, suffering is bad? If you don't want to suffer, you are in control of your own brain, just don't suffer. Uh, too bad, I'm not in control of my own brain, my gut bacteria is, and also there's a lot of parts of my brain that I just can't control because consciousness doesn't even work in the human sense. We're in this sort of limbo world where we sort of have control over our destinies and our lives and our, we can sort of, we're just aware enough to appreciate that we don't have control, which is essentially endless torture. And as I come to realise this fact, I start to think, you know what, I think I'm starting to figure out where it all went wrong. It wasn't capitalism, it wasn't civilization. it was evolution from non-conscious to conscious. Con consciousness, by the way, is an illusion, this is kind of obvious, uh, this is, I, I don't really want to get into this right now, but I feel like someone's probably going to bring it up, so I should just get it out of the way. I'm aware, consciousness and individuality, both kind of illusions, but that doesn't really matter because they are, how do I, how do I express this? They may be illusory, but they also have effects. Um, maybe a better word would be self-awareness rather than consciousness. You can't argue that we're not self-aware, we are. You could maybe argue that animals have some sort of awareness and maybe it's not as black and white as Ligotti puts it where humans are objectively completely separate from everything else but we cert it doesn't really matter because we certainly think of ourselves that way in general and as like a evidenced by all of human history uh, so it doesn't really matter what's true in this sense it just kind of matters how we think because I'm talking about consciousness here not uh, the reality outside of consciousness, it's about how we perceive ourselves um, and manifest ourselves. So, that being said, consciousness was a mistake. Uh, this was where we all went wrong. So what's the ideal form of life? <laughs> get ready, get ready, it's all about to happen. Bryophytes and fungi. Bryophytes and fungi. Bryophytes and fungi. Ever heard of a depressive mushroom? I haven't. Ever heard of a suicidal moss? Um, nope. Wait a minute. Both of those species are, in almost every imaginable way, far, far more successful than humans in every sort of every category for success evolutionary evolutionarily moss beats us by a long shot uh dinosaurs oh, when were dinosaurs first around mm, 20 million years ago ish mm, yeah popped into existence about 20 million years ago they're pretty old but they're gone now that you know 20 million years ago think about this think about how okay Time is really hard to conceptualize because humans are broken, but let's just try and think about time here. So think about how distant 2,000 years ago is. So 2,000 years ago when, you know, the, the, the Christian era, the era where Jesus Christ, he came about, he popped into existence about 2,000, 2020-ish years ago, right? About that time. Don't know what's happening with my accent right now. Sometimes it just happens. Can't do nothing about it. Um, so Jesus, that sort of time. Think about how different the world was back then. That's only 2,000 years ago. Now think about 10,000 years ago. 10,000 years ago. That's 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 almost incomprehensible. Think about how different human civilization or not civilization was back then. Okay. Now think about how much bigger 1 million is from uh, 10,000, if you can even imagine this. Now 20 million, 20 million years ago was when dinosaurs were around. So it makes, it's obvious, like, they were around 
20 million years ago. Of course things have changed since then. Of course they're not around anymore. Something had to happen, in this case a meteor strike. But a lot of the other, no mammals that are, you know, there's no giant bugs around like there was back then. Of course, in 20 million years something has to have changed. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Moss, mosses, there's early examples of mosses from 40 million years ago, twice as old as the dinosaurs. Hold on a minute. And you mean to tell me that the mosses from 40 million years ago are so similar to the mosses that we have today that you can categorize them, you can use modern moss to categorize 40 million year old samples of fossilized moss that they are so similar to the moss that is still around that you can directly categorize one it's barely different that is how much better moss is at being a living creature than humans so incomprehensibly much more successful than humans it's just absurd there are mosses from the tips of the top of the earth what's it called north pole that'll be it arctic that one the one up there and they're, they're all around mosses they're everywhere they've been everywhere for a really long time they're just much better at everything than humans um they're fucking sick so that's my <laughs> there you go mosses internets humans realities magics histories it's all in this video i think this might be my magnum opus man I think this might be what I've been trying to create this whole time. <laughs> oh my god, what's happening to me? <laughs> when? Question, when did I go completely nuts? When did it happen? At what point did I just go nuts? At what point did I go from being like a someone who could conceivably at some point fit into regular society to the guy that wants to uh, create a cyber moss paradise uh, for moss <laughs> oh my god oh, shit i can't go back to how i ever was i'm never <laughs> it's fucked so what's the solution to consciousness being terrible well there's kind of two solutions i've said that moss is better and that i want the extinction of the human race but i it's li there's a li little bit more nuance to it than that than just than just like oh well it's easy we just go back to before there were humans and there was only moss because firstly there was never only moss there was a bunch of other shit around at that time moss just happens to be one of the better ones and uh, it looks really cool and uh, it's it's really good at doing things it doesn't change much that's one of the reasons I'm so into moss uh, it's just so efficient it's just such a if if God made you made, made something in its own image then it would be moss because moss is essentially the perfect creature it has only the things it needs and none of the things it doesn't i get really obsessed with moss once i start talking it's really hard to, for me to stop talking about moss once i've started talking about moss by the way also a big fan of mo of uh, liverworts and uh, those sorts of things there's the other the similar things to moss uh and you know I could do, I could, I'm down with, with some ferns, and as I said before, fungi are comrades too, fungi, mushrooms, all those, those guys, they're comrades too, they're cool, they're cool, they've been around for even longer than mosses actually, if you want to talk about it, and algae, and, and uh, lichen, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty uh, down with algae and lichen as well, I think those guys are pretty chill and, uh, you know, pretty underrated, uh, but but right now my focus is, is on trying to understand what the moss is telling us because you know there's a lot of people who are really interested in what the mushrooms are telling us specifically mostly because they have uh, some sort of indirect communication method through psilocybin although I have my doubts as to how much of that is actually communication and how much of it is just a sort of uh, recursion of our own flawed consciousness like a, a consciousness eating itself in a sense uh, self-cannibalization uh, and how much of it is actually communication you know I have my doubts as to that but I have no way of proving that uh, so yeah a lot of a lot of people are really interested to, into mushrooms and uh, no one's really talking about the moss no one's no one's out here proponing no one's out here 
speaking for the masses, so I guess someone has to do it, and that someone is me. And uh, if someone else wants to come and speak for the algae and lichen of the world, I'll be completely down with you, man. I need to get into some algae and lichen myself, you know, I've just been so distracted by moss that I haven't even had time to dive into the algae and lichens of the world. But they're pretty cool too, so what is the solution <laughs> to consciousness? <laughs> As a species, we are trapped, somewhere between total control and total non-existence. This is kind of exemplified in the modern political landscape. As I've mentioned before, the dichotomy of left and right being the two places and everything in between is everything in between is it's never really been super accurate, but it's really falling apart at this point as some sort of false dichotomy from the 1700s, which is what it really has always been, but you know, it's been pretty relevant politically for a long time since they're both modernist ideologies and we lived in a modernist world, but whether you like it or not, we live in a postmodern world now, and there's some weird shit going on, like accelerationism, for example. See, accelerationism is at heart a Marxist ideology. It doesn't work without Marxists, Marxist uh, um, theories of capitalism being a, a self-perpetuating positive feedback loop. Uh, you know, money, labor money plus profit, the basic Marxian economic formula, uh, that is sort of at the heart of accelerationism, uh, and, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, even the primitivism, Ted Kaczynski type stuff, uh, is based on a, a very modernist meta-narrative of the uh, endless march of technological progress being a bad thing, that this X thing will happen and inevitably reach X thing, which is, if you know anything about modern and postmodern philosophy, which I know, I don't know how much people understand, but that's a very modernist thing, these sorts of vast meta-narratives, like some sort of fantasy, start, fantasy story are very modernist. However, both of these ideologies that I was talking about are super postmodernist. I mean, wherever my fucking CCRU book has gone, they're talking about time lemurs and magical CA Cthulhu cults. If you've ever read any Nick Land, you know that he is not particularly concerned with the sort of enlightened thinking uh, and very much interested in postmodern occultic stuff. And Ted Kaczynski has, you know, also got a lot of postmodern anarchism inspirations and theories and. It all goes together, man, it all goes together, but, what am I, what am I trying to say, I need to really, I need to start honing in on my point, because this video is again a bit ridiculously long, I need to start honing in on my point, firstly I would like to address one thing, uh, I sort of brushed it off at the beginning, but I, I guess I'll just, uh, not at the beginning, the last segment, but I guess I'll just address it really quickly. Why aren't I, I mean, I feel like there are a lot of people who watched my, the last thing and they were like, um, how can you possibly say that consciousness is a bad thing? Of what sort of edge are you on? I tried to do my best to explain it in briefly, but I, I don't think I did the best job. I know I didn't do the best job of explaining it. I never do do the best job of explaining myself with words. I'm not very good at it. Uh, how can you possibly argue for antinatalism? And there's some people who will just click with, but there are a lot of people, I'm sure, who could, couldn't possibly understand that viewpoint. That's fine, doesn't matter. But what I'm saying is, uh, if I were to try my best to fully explain it, it would just be a bad version of Thomas Ligotti's conspiracy against the human race. So if you want to understand what I'm trying to say, or are just interested in this at all, Please read that book, because I cannot do as good a job at explaining myself as he does, and he explains himself. It's not like a lot of... He's very against the idea, even in that book he mentions, uh, that uh, the whole philosophers sort of masking their ideas in this wordplay and all this complicated poetic language and stuff like that is a... Uh, it's kind of stupid, <laughs> and he doesn't do any of that. Uh, so would highly recommend checking that book out. It'll do a much better job of explaining it. The other question or thing you might have is, well, if you hate humans so much and want to be edgy, why don't you just kill yourself? That's what I said before. 
no reason as I just don't have to. There's no reason to. It's, you know, why why would I? The, the, just All I have to do is not have children and I would have successfully done Praxis. Um, I don't really care about killing other people. I don't want to do that. Uh, that's I, I don't pretend to have authority over them. Um, I'd like to encourage them not to have children, but I don't particularly think I should be the one to kill other people. If someone else wants to kill themselves, that's fine. If I want to kill myself, that's fine. For now, at the very least, it doesn't really matter, because I'm going to die anyway. It really makes a very little difference if I die now or in 50 years. It's the same end result. It's, it's inconsequential. Um, anyway, back to what I was saying. Humans are in this sort of limbo. See, you're either completely unconscious, uh, like a moss, for example, <laughs> or you are completely conscious, like a god, who can control every aspect of their thought. Um, we're somewhere in the middle, where we are definitely aware of the fact that we exist and we're going to die and we are alive and we are separate from things that aren't alive, in some sort of sense. Whether or not that's true, I'm not going to go into, but that's how we perceive ourselves, so for the sense for the sake of this discussion, it may as well be true. Um, let me just quickly make sure that I am recording. Good. Uh, oh yeah, I'm not sure if I ever mentioned this in a video before, but a, a long time ago I took the front-facing camera out of my phone because I was paranoid that people were looking at me through it, uh, which is a perfectly reasonable paranoia you don't have. Fuck's sake. <laughs> it's a perfectly reasonable paranoia to have if you, if you know anything about um, government spying techniques, but whatever. So I took it out and then lost it, so my phone just has no front facing camera, so I have to record everything with the back facing camera, which makes it very hard to frame things. And that's why all my videos are pointing at the ground instead of just turning it around and pointing it at me. Now you know. Anyway, my point, I gotta do the point, I gotta do the point of the video. Um, come on, the point, the point. Humans are trapped in this limbo state between godlike superpowers and non-existence. Uh, it's kind of utopian to ever imagine that we would have this godlike superpower. It's not completely. Uh, it definitely. It's not that I can't. I can't say that it will never happen. It may happen, but at that point, we're no longer humans. So uh, that's fine, because my argument is against human consciousness, not any possible form of something that might be called consciousness. Because if you have the if you are fully in control, you can control all of your thoughts, you would just choose not to have any negative thoughts ever and choose to live in, well maybe not everyone would, but you could choose to live in a state of perpetual ecstasy and just having that opportunity available solves all the problems that I am talking about right now. So since we can't do that, uh, that's so, oh, also would mean that we would never we'd be immortal, and death is also kind of an important part of what it means to be human. Um, or, or the the critiques I have of consciousness, because the the fact that we know we're going to die is kind of one of the is is maybe the biggest source of suffering. Uh, you can't really distract us. You you can distract yourself from it. You can do things, but at the end of the day, we all are aware that we are one day going to die. Um, who knows? So, if you got rid of that, if you were an immortal being that was basically a god, uh, then it would be fine. And if you were a completely unconscious living being, it would be fine. But we are trapped in this weird limbo, so the obvious thing, you either go forwards towards godlikeness, or you go backwards towards nothingness. Uh, you either go post-human or pre-human, that's essentially what I'm going to call it. As a, uh, I think that we're starting to see this in a sort of, uh, maybe, maybe um, not sure what sort of, like a, a sort of little way manifesting itself in mainstream politics, because we've got like Andrew Yang, for example, running right now, who is running on the basis of uh, not left or right, but forwards, I think was his slogan at some point, or something, He, I think he retweeted something like that. Uh, which which uh, he's sort of basing his platform on, and uh, you know we have the someone like the eco-fascist killer in New Zealand who, uh, you know, eco-fascism is definitely something akin to uh, regression to a pre-human state. Uh, so 
we're starting to see this sort of bubble to the surface in an unconscious manifestation in mainstream-ish politics. I mean, mass murders in the name of politics are mainstream politics, whether you want them to be or not. They're just not party politics. That is mainstream. It was reported in every news source in the world. That is mainstream. Um, but so we've seen this manifest itself, but it's it's sort of a just the way it's bubbling to the surface of this bigger question of either post-human or pre-human. Uh, now, where am I? That's kind of a hard question, because both of those things solve the problem, um, and it's sort of just a matter of what happens first. Do humans wipe themselves out before they? It's it's it, one of the two options is inevitable. Uh, Either way, human everyone is aware, there is no kidding yourself, that humanity uh, won't last forever. Even if we manage to last till, till the heat, heat death of the universe, the heat death of the universe is coming at some point. It's literally impossible for humanity to last forever. So, eventually, something, humanity is going to be gone, and we'll have one of these two options is going to have happened. Either humanity will have evolved beyond human consciousness and become some sort of post-human them thingness, or it would have uh, nuclear itself or antinatalisted itself <laughs> into non-existence. One of the two options will happen. Uh, I personally can't think of any other option. Uh, I mean, I can't think of any possibility where humanity doesn't eventually die. I think that is a something that is self-apparent, self-evident, that eventually all of humanity will go extinct, which is also kind of one of the reasons that it's torturous to exist in a human body and brain, um, uh, which is, I'm not, I just, I mean, there we go, I'm happy with either, that's my solutions, that's the solutions to this problem, we either we just get rid of humanity either by make, becoming something beyond human, uh, using some sort of technology or wizardry, cybermancy sort of thing, uh, to, to become essentially the human instrumentality project, or we uh, extinct ourselves and, and let the moss have its chance. Not that the moss isn't already having its chance. Mosses don't give a fuck about humans. There's probably moss growing in on a wall that you own right now because ownership doesn't matter to mosses because they're the ultimate anarchists. Um, <laughs> what am I talking about? How did I even get here? What went wrong in my life? I'm talking about post-human anarcho-moss world. There you go, that's, that's me, by the way. Uh, if I had a Twitter bio, it would be post-human Nakamos worldist. That's <laughs> there we go. Post-human Nakamos worldist. That is my. This is my ideology. Post-human Nakamos worldist. <sighs> Glad this video's over. Now I don't have to ever talk about any of this stuff again because I'm sure everyone will fully understand and comprehend what I'm saying. There's no way anyone could possibly misinterpret me because I have no idea how to speak and language is inherently flawed for even getting across ideas like consciousness. Uh, pretty much the best, the most important thing that Stirner wrote is about is his idea of the creative nothing as something that is indescribable by language, that the true individual at the heart of all the layers is something that is it's not really anything in the, tr the way we perceive things through language, but it's just something, it's nothing that can create, it is the creative nothing. Anyway, I think that's the best thing, what am I talking about? Language is shit, is what I'm talking about, but we all know this. Um, Post-human, how do we get there? Is, this, this, is that what I was going to talk about? How do we get there? How do we fix it? You know, then, essentially, okay, if, if, if post-human is the thesis, and uh, pre-human is the antithesis. Again, into some philosophy terms here. Thesis, antithesis. Synthesis. 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 
I shaved my beard, by the way. Um, I haven't looked at my chin in literally years. I always had at least like a little beard. Um, I've, I, I don't think I've fully shaved like this in at least a year, probably like two years. And I, I've come to discover I look a little bit like Wojak. Uh, Wojak feels guy. Um, got a little bit of that bulbousness to my face, you know, a little bulbous Wojak feelsness. A little bit of bulbous Wojak feelsness. <laughs> I'm a little bit Bojack, Bojack Horseman. <laughs> a little bit Bojack Horseman, Wojak Feelsman, you know? Got a little bit of that to me. What can you do, eh? Maybe maybe girls like that. Girls like guys that look like they're dying, right? Girls like drug addict looking guys, right? I mean, not that I care, because I don't plan on ever having children. And if you plan on having children, you are the enemy of life itself. You are the reason we can't have nice things. So, in conclusion, just stop, just, just stop, just stop kidding yourself that life is good. Just stop. I mean, you don't have to. Who am I to tell you that uh, that, that life is is bad? Oh, don't listen to me. Don't listen to Thomas Ligotti. Don't read the book because you're scared that it will make you depressed. Don't do it. I'm not forcing you to. But. Just know that you're kidding yourself, because we all know deep down that um, uh, the problem, sure, capitalism is a problem, sure, all these things are problems, but it goes a little deeper, sure, sure, if, if it was even theoretically possible to establish global homo, global homo, fully automated luxury gay space communism if that was remotely feasible let's pretend it is for now if that was a thing and we were all there and we lived in this communist utopia you know what we'd still be human beings we'd still be fucked there is no solution we wouldn't be happy synthesis synthesis post-human anarcho-moss world you know, some people were asking, uh, or I heard someone say in a comment or on a Discord thing or something, uh, the reason I watch your channel is just in the hopes that one day you'll finally go nuts and I can watch it or something along those lines. I think those people don't understand. I've, I've done been nuts. I've done been nuts for years, mate. I went nuts a long time ago. I went, oh boy. If you take nuts as someone who's just so... They're, they're so incompatible with regular society as to basically deserve their own categorization. Welcome to Nuts. Enjoy your stay.